long, arduous process of design here. My involvement goes two and a half years, but it stretches back further. I'd like to acknowledge all the folks that have been very much involved in this process, this, I think, almost five years of conversation around the street. Um, we're excited to have this hearing tonight. We're working in conjunction with the state to, to move this project forward. Um, we ultimately decided to submit this uh, project to the state to uh, ultimately hope for state and federal funding. It's going to be an expensive job when we're all said and done. Um, obviously, tonight you'll see a presentation from our consultant, Howard Seth Hudson, who's worked closely with the city, city departments such as public works, foster transportation, who are also represented here tonight, um, as well as many abutters and community members, residents, uh, advocates. We've heard from everybody, and I think we've created a, a design um, that going forward represents a multimodal um, next step for the city of Boston in a very important location. So I just want to thank all of you for being here. Look forward to the conversation tonight. Look forward to the conversation ongoing as we continue this process happening. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Now, once the hearing has been completed this evening, the attendance sheet will become a part of the public record of the hearing. So if you'd like your attendance at the hearing to be part of the public record, please sign in to the sign-in sheet located at the entrance. Handouts containing the details regarding this project are next to the sign-in sheet. First, I'd like to introduce the members of the hearing panel. By immediate left is Mr. Dave Madden and Mr. Rick Santini of the Howestine Hudson Consulting Firm, working for the City of Boston. To the other left is Mr. Craig Sheehan from our right of way bureau in Boston, and Mr. Joe Sakalos of the Arlington Typing and Mailing from Arlington Mass will be making a verbatim transcript of tonight's hearing. The notice of the public hearing appeared in the Boston Globe in the Boston Herald on July 25th and August 1st of this year. In page 7 of the handout explains the project purpose. This hearing gives us an opportunity to make a formal presentation of the proposed project and at the same time allows us to record your input regarding this project. Federal aid funding with the Federal Highway Administration funding 80% of the total construction costs and mass DOT funds the remaining 20%. This project must be programmed in the statewide transportation improvement program in the appropriate federal fiscal year in order for mass DOT to solicit bids for eventual construction. The total estimated cost of the project is about $12 million. And this does not include any right-of-way acquisition costs. At this time, I'd like to ask Craig from our right-of-way section to explain the right-of-way procedure. Thank you, Al. Um, all guys in advance, this is a formal notice, so its tone is it's formal. It's usually not that boring. When the Commonwealth, acting through the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, indicated it would accept this $12 million project for funding, under the Transportation Improvement Program, your municipality accepted certain responsibilities. One of those responsibilities is to acquire all the necessary rights in private and public lands for the design, construction, and implementation of this project. My function is to review and recommend procedures that your municipality will utilize in acquiring these rights. The procedures used must comply with both federal and state regulations. The current design plans indicate that permanent easements and temporary easements will be required. Your municipality may acquire the needed rights through a combination of donations, eminent domain, deed grants, permits, or rights of entrance. Frequently, local municipalities will appeal for donations. Donation procedures minimize the acquisition cost for your community. Donations and rights of entrance are not required, and property owners are entitled to an appraisal and just compensation. This project cannot be advertised until the new proposed right-of-way is secured, and the Massachusetts Department of Transportation's Right-of-Way Bureau issues a right-of-way certificate. Affected property owners' rights are protected under our Mass General Laws, primarily Chapter 79, and because this project is receiving federal funds, the property owners' rights are further defined under Title III of the Real Property Acts of 1970 as amended. I will be happy to answer any general questions concerning right-of-way activities during the open forum, and I will be available after the hearing for any specific questions you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Craig. Now, Mr. Dave Madden and Mr. Rick Santini from Howardstein Hudson will describe the project in detail for you. I ask that you hold your questions until they complete their presentation. Dave? Just for the record, it's Rick Lantini. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, uh, I've been working on this project for about five years now, and I've uh, been working closely, as uh, Jonathan mentioned, with the city and the state on uh, coming to this point. Uh, let me just orient you a little bit here. Most of you that don't know where you are right now. So, Boston, here is uh, the uh, Zaytel Bridge, Garden, and the project site. 
runs generally uh, southeast to north, uh, southwest to northeast uh, in the city of Boston. Getting a little more specific again, here's the garden. Uh, this is the Old Way. This is the federal uh, building, which is General Services Administration. Uh, the garden, the north end over here. And so our project limits essentially started over at uh, the back side of the uh, garden where the uh, parking garage is, and it continued along the Lomasney Way, and it picked up the signalized intersection of uh, Merrimack, Stanford, Causeway, and Lomasney, also known as Lowell Square. It continued easterly to uh, uh, the signalized intersection of Portland Street, Friend, Canal, Gabriel Street, signalized at the uh, Aquilon Way uh, Garden. Uh, access uh, over the old central artery or the new central artery. Uh, two signalized intersections along some of these new intersections that are part of the uh, central artery project. And over here to the North Washington Street at Causeway signalized intersection, also known as King Square. A little bit closer in again, this is the uh, federal building. This is Lowell Square. You can see today it's a very confusing intersection by many, and it's hard to nav navigate if you're a pedestrian and a uh, bicyclist through this area. Uh, there are pollards that run around the uh, federal building. <coughs> Generally, there are three lanes heading uh, eastbound, let's call it, and three lanes heading westbound, with one of them being an exclusive right turn up from Madison Way. Here's Merrimack Street that was converted into a two-way street over the past decade. And again, you remember that there used to be the overhead uh, green light that ran up Lamazney over Causeway Street. Um, that obviously was torn down. And um, some of the remnants of the footings and everything remain in the ground. But that also explains a lot of the reasons why the road was set up the way it was. It was to accommodate some of the columns that uh, existed to accommodate the, the green line. So uh, just running a little bit further up the street now. Here's the garden again, here's the parking in front of the garden. Again, in this section here, we have two lanes with a cab stand in front of the garden. And uh, back here is three lanes, and generally three lanes in the eastbound direction. Um, here is uh, Canal Street. And uh, remember, when the Central Artery existed, there were on and off ramps at this location. And so back before the Central Artery was uh, the elevated, there was a tremendous amount of volume on Causeway Street, um, you know, people accessing the, the highway system from this location. This is uh, Keeney Square. Here's uh, North Washington Street, the North Washington Street Bridge up to the north here. And you can see the uh, long pedestrian crossings that are out there today. Uh, we have stepped crossings to medians. The, uh, the uh, historic trail obviously runs through here as well. Free <coughs> trail. And then, uh, so one of the things that we looked at when we were uh, studying this is there's actually more pedestrians out here than there are vehicles at this point. And so we needed to do something to accommodate more pedestrian traffic. And obviously, a busy uh, North Station area, uh, both not, not just during events, obviously, but also uh, commuter traffic. Um, uh, for the commuter rail, the green line, the orange line, and there's a heavy pedestrian flow along the east-west of uh, the northern side of Causeway Street as well, as well as all these crossings up and down Friend, Portland, uh, Canal. And so we were looking at ways to uh, make pedestrian enhancements, and so Rick will get into more detail of, of the specific areas, but in general what we did is we narrowed the sidewalks, we cleaned up the Lowell Square intersection, and I'll go into more detail about that in a little bit. We, the blue stripes you can see everywhere running along are bike lanes, so we're accommodating bicyclists. Again, we're widening both sidewalks uh, by quite a bit, and we're also improving operations over at Kane Square. Here's a better look, uh, more detailed look at uh, Lowell Square. Uh, this time now, north is facing uh, to your right. So here's Causeway Street over here. Here's the federal building. 
some of the one of the heaviest crossings is over a thousand pedestrians that cross this in the peak hour in the morning. Um, and so this crossing over here, uh, we wanted to pay special attention to, as well as there were a tremendous amount of jaywalkers throughout the corridor that we were trying to kind of define where they should be. And so one of the things that we've done is we've put uh, some landscaping and planters along the edge of the roads. And not only that, but we're widening these edges as well to channelize pedestrians to the crossings. Um, here, the crossing of Stanford Street, which is essentially the same cross section as it is today, and Merrimack Street, essentially the same cross section as it is today, although we're eliminating the median. And uh, we're providing this is a rumble strip, it's not an island that we cross to, it's flush with the pavement, but it's to more clearly define as a vehicle where you belong and which direction you should be turning as to whether or not you're continuing up the Madison Way or turning right onto Causeway Street. You can see that we're also making some minor improvements to the back, this is the garage entrance, that uh, are the rear entrance to the garden over here. So we're better defining this crossing as well and putting a better refuge area in there. This median here is being widened today. It exists essentially where that left turn lane is proposed. And we're sliding it over towards the east, towards the uh, GSA building providing two lanes towards National Street, three lanes, well, two, two lanes, and a turn lane coming off of Lamasty to turn lane onto Causeway Street. On Causeway Street, we're, we're defining this much better. The signal lanes operation is going to be much simpler than it is out there today. We're uh, accommodating a bike lane through here and a right turn lane to the uh, right of the bike lane, and then two through lanes. Generally, we were only having one lane feed into the section of Causeway Street. And so we're providing just one extra wide lane over there with a bike lane adjacent to it, a wide sidewalk on this side. Today, this uh, operation, because it is so confusing, there isn't a pedestrian <coughs> phase today. With this design, it's generally going to be concurrent operation with crossings happening the entire width of uh, each leg with the exception of the crossing of Causeway Street. Um, that will be a stepped crossing, and all the others will be full width. Um, and that's the lower of the crossings at this intersection. Generally, our lanes have been narrowed to 10 and a half feet in this area on Causeway Street, and we had to get a design exception from the DOT to do that. And we did that so that we could accommodate bike lanes and wide sidewalks, as well as pedestrian refuge that's uh, ample enough for the pedestrian except crossing over here on Boston Street. So this actually is uh, a raised island. This area in here is going to be a concrete rumble lower to the ground to help define the travel lanes. Okay, now this is the core section of Causeway Street. Again, this is the garden over here. Now north is, you can see up there, heading that way. Portland Street over here, that remains signalized, and we, uh, we have two crossings, uh, one, one crossing Portland Street, one uh, crossing uh, Causeway Street, and again, that is a full crossing, that's not a stepped crossing. And then here you'll notice a couple of uh, interesting things, and I'll show you what these end up looking like, but these are speed tables, and one of the things that we're trying to do is slow the vehicular traffic coming through this area, because it, again, it is a very pedestrian heavy area, and these two uh, crossings are unsignalized, they'll remain unsignalized as part of this design. So we wanted to do something to slow traffic and give pedestrians a wider crossing, and so I'll show you what that looks like. We've also, uh, through this area over here, there were a tremendous amount of jaywalkers. And again, we're trying to uh, channel pedestrians to the crosswalks, and so the city's working through the BRA with uh, a design with some vertical elements through what this area in red here shows to prohibit uh, pedestrians from crossing the mid-block, other than at the crosswalks. The Haverhill Street intersection is signalized. Uh, well, let me just go back to the uh, Canal Street intersection here. Again, today, you can take that, you can take a left out of there, I believe, as far as it goes. No, this is, a, uh, Friend Street, I'm sorry, will be a uh, right in only. You won't be able to take a left onto Friend Street. Canal Street will be a right out only. Um, 
one of the things that we're doing is this section over here so that the fire department can get access to uh, Front Street is this will be a multiple curb and we've gone over this with the Boston Fire Department so that fire trucks can get over uh, over that median. So there will be no vertical elements in the middle of either of these crossings over here. April Street at Aqualon Way will be signalized. And uh, again, you can see the bike lanes uh, on, on the other side. There will be commercial parking between on the south side of uh, Causeway Street between Portland and Fred. This is a uh, taxi uh, between Fred and Canal. And we take uh, a shuttle bus between uh, in front of the Avenue building. And on the north side, this is over the expressway, uh, the shuttle bus uh, pickup drop off to the north. And again, bike lanes to this point all the way down the Causeway on both sides. This is the speed table that I was talking about. So this is a Friend Street, so Friend Street would be over this way. The garden on this side over here. And so there would be no curb reveal over here we, uh, on, on either side. This would be, this area over here would be flush with the sidewalk all the way across. And it would be ramped up and down on either side. And again, you can see there's some vertical elements through the median on this side. And this is that multiple curve I was talking about. Coming over to King Square, now North Washington Street and North it is to the right. And this is Commercial and Causeway Street up here. Some of the things, again, there was a median that exists that exists today uh, and it's a stepped crossing on Causeway Street. We're eliminating that and we're providing all current walks. One of the things we're trying to do is widen these corners as much as possible. And we're also signalizing Endicott Street, which today Endicott coming up there is basically a free-for-all with traffic turning um, beyond the stop line that exists today and, and it's a fairly dangerous situation, so we're trying to remedy that. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing here, and we've heard that you know there's concerns about this pedestrian crossing over here, we've tried to let, uh, lessen that crossing distance and also bump out this area right in front over here um, so that vehicles coming around the corner and pedestrians can see each other because again it will be all concurrent uh, crossings. We're changing uh, the, the widths of the lane and the size of the median on the North Washington Street approach to the North Washington Street Bridge. And again, we're shortening and fattening as best we can all of these corners for pedestrians. One of the things today in the peak hour, there's a restriction on uh, North Washington Street northbound to turn onto uh, uh, Causeway Street. That'll become a 24-7 situation. There will be no more left turn at that location. To turn, to get onto Causeway Street from the north end, you would have to go to Valenti Way onto Paperwell Street, and that will access uh, Causeway Street. Rick can get more into the detail of the physical uh, work being done out at the uh, project site. Rick. Now, also, I should mention, now I have uh, other slides that we can discuss if there are questions about what kind of volumes we're trying to accommodate or what the phasing is. Uh, we can get into that. I have slides that show that information at the end. I agree. Rick Bettini with Howard Stein Hudson. Uh, Dave and John already touched upon that we approach this project in a complete streets type of way where there's equal footing, trying to be equal footing to everyone, pedestrians, transit users, motor vehicles, um, and pedestrians. Um, for the most part, a couple of the uh, intersections, King and Mall Square, those are a little bit slanted towards the vehicle, <coughs> motor vehicle, because they, they, tra they uh, cross a lot of traffic and the, the causeway course section would be a little bit more leaning towards pedestrian. Um, one of the things we're doing here is we're widening sidewalks, as Dave has mentioned, that uh, gives us, it allows us to uh, shrink the crossing distances on some of these streets, which are pretty significant in a couple spots. It allows us to be able to uh, fix some of the grading for um, the handicap. There's a couple of slips that are pretty steep in the actual width of the sidewalk that can help correct the grading in some areas. Uh, we're also going to be uh, providing landscape enhancements that include like, some specialty pavements, some, some pedestrian lighting, which would be a little more intimate than just 
25 foot high street lights. Uh, we also have like some uh, distinctive uh, designs on some of the intersections and medians, as uh, David already alluded to. We're also doing some utility work too, but most of the utility work is going to be related to like traffic signals, um, street lighting, and adjusting some structures. So they're not work that can typically uh, disrupt services for the residences or businesses. Uh, so now, this is a section that's we're, we're, um, we're not doing too much work except uh, reorganizing the islands. Uh, but, uh, right, right here, we're, uh, we're putting new, new curb ramps, but that's still going to be the, uh, it's going to be a cement concrete sidewalk on the um, uh, southwestern side here, matching what's existing. On this side, we'll actually start our specialties. It'll be a specialty concrete sidewalk that has a stamp pattern in it and it has a granite accent strip. Uh, it's going to be further defined as we go with 25% design now. I can get a question of what it looks like or something like put the full scale plan to it after reading. In this area, we're uh, widening the sidewalk, <coughs> particularly right here, widening about nine feet. This will, uh, doesn't give more pedestrian room, but it allows us to put this, uh, it allows us to put like this, this planter here, which is, I think right now is an 18 inch high granite planter. We're also pulling up the sidewalk on Merrimack Street here at the causeway, about 9 to 17 feet. And we're organizing the crosswalks here. The crosswalks here, I don't know if you've ever tried to, I mean, I'm sure most of you have crossed from the West End Place. You have to have like two islands to get over here. It's a distance of almost 135 feet. You feel like you're trapped on an island when you're going out there. Uh, the way we reorganize it now, this, this distance here is, um, it's only, what do I have, it's 82 feet now, so that would be a significant improvement. Right here, this bump out, uh, as Stanford Street will uh, we have the crossing only from like 61 to, uh, 67 to 61 feet. This one here, Merrimack, it goes kind of an angle now. It's almost 80 feet. That'll be uh, trimmed down to about 60 feet for the crossing. And then right here at Causeway, uh, once again, it's another one. The ranch will do a kind of diagonal. So it's like 90 feet. And that'll be dropped down to about 70 feet. <coughs> Uh, right here uh, is one of the few areas where we're probably where we're not widening this out because the, there's a bump out right here that we have to remove to uh, keep all the travel lanes going and provide bike accommodations. And out here, it'll pump back out to where the sidewalk is currently about 15 feet, and it will be 26 feet wide from the, uh, from the curb line to the existing fence that's at the garden. On the lower part of the site, the existing, I want to say, is about, I think it's like 11 or 12 feet. It'll be bumped out to 15 feet. I think uh, with these planters, though, I think behind these planters are actually 13 feet clear, so this is actually more like 18 feet from the curb to the, to the buildings. The data center, so this is a raised plant right here, a raised island right here. Just speak up, please. I'm oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Right here, this, this is a raised island, and this, this is a rumble strip from here to here. Uh, right here is one of our, this is the, right here, this pattern you see here is, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, the crosswalks like at Huntington or near City Hall where the, uh, there's a stamp pattern in the pavement and they put the thermal plastic. So this design right now would actually be made to resemble a, a real yard, but you know, it's still in process too. Um, you know, what's the answer? Like these, these here right here, we're adding pedestrian level lights, which I mentioned before, about 15 feet high as opposed to 25 feet high the street. We'll still have street lights too for safety, but the pedestrian will give it a more friendly feel. David mentioned too here we have um, a raised uh, intersection at Fred Street. Once again, uh, you know, it helps provide visibility for the motor vehicles and the pedestrians. It's also a flush condition, so it's actually it helps the mobility and uh, here we have we have like we have a narrow down here for loading and one here for, tip for taxis and but the sidewalks to remain about 14 feet wide because we're we'll widening the general sidewalks in this area. Once again, we have another one of these uh, speed tables at Canal Street. Uh, and then um, and one of the things I want to look at this, this sidewalk here is about, will be about 26 feet wide when we widen it. Because that will be, a, right now there's a potential uh, drop off for a, a shuttle bus. So, so the sidewalk will be about 14 feet wide here. On the other side, the current uh, width is about 13 feet. It'll go to about 18. And it'll probably be down to like uh, 14 feet or so when we have down like this for now, whether it's a bus stop or a taxi stand. Uh, once again, I, once again I, mean, I forget to mention again, this is a specialty pavement that started at the Federal Building and continues down off down Harvard Street on both sides of Causeway Street. 
And this intersection here, we're uh, rerouting. This, this is a kind of an awkward merge, and I think I'll if you ever taken it. So we're actually straightening it out here, and it's signalized. Uh, this is about 17 feet wide, which is about the existing width of that outlet right now. And right here, we'll be, we'll be, we're supposed to be we're planning a raised intersection with, with concrete pavers. I think, uh, I think with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Al. He'll tell you how to uh, correspond with Mass DOT after this meeting, and he'll also open up for questions after his summary. Great. Thank you, Rick. Excellent job, Gabe. Very good. Thank you. <coughs> Now, the plans being presented uh, this evening are not complete. The next step will be to review the comments received this evening, then amend and complete the plans for advertising and eventual construction. Before we open the hearing to you, I will explain the hearing procedure. First, as stated previously, the purpose of this hearing is to solicit your input regarding this project. As the plans are not yet complete, we may not be able to answer all of your questions or respond to all of your comments at this time. Next, we ask that anyone who wishes to have his or her comments entered into the official hearing transcript, please stand up, identify yourself by name and affiliation, whether you're an abutter, a local official, or just a concerned citizen, and spell your last name. This is necessary in order for us to obtain the full verbatim transcript as required by law. Also, on the last sheet of the handout is a mailing sheet. If you have any questions or comments, if you'd like to submit writing, please use the sheet for that purpose. You may leave the sheet with me tonight or you may mail it in to the department within 10 days of this date and it will become part of the official record. Finally, it's normal procedure to ask elected officials to offer their comments first. Are there any official, federal officials who would like to speak at this time? Seeing none, are there any state officials who would like to speak at this time? Seeing none, are there any local officials who would like to speak at this time? This hearing is now open to the public and we welcome your questions and comments. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Jim Zaka. I live on Causeway Street, Z-A-H-K-A. -A. I see four issues here. It doesn't seem to really take into account the realities of uh, taxis and the, and the buses. So four issues. One is you get duck boats going down, if I understood correctly. You're going to narrow the lanes. It's hard enough for them to get down the street already. Uh, two, the taxis and the, uh, and the buses don't even pull into their areas now. And if you're going to shorten them, it's going to be hard, hard to imagine they're going to be any better at it. Three, they do U-turns like it's legal and it's, you, know, they, you should do it. You know, it's, it's kind of absurd. And then four, I try to envision riding my bike down Causeway Street where you've got taxis doing U-turns, buses doing U-turns, um, and, and a lot of general mayhem. It sounds like it's going to get worse here. All right, thank you, Jim. Um, well, let's uh, take one at a time. Duck boats, um, it's going to be reduced speed. Travel lanes are narrow. Uh, we have the raised intersections. It's all an effort to reduce the speed. Uh, when people are going slower, they drive more cautiously. How, how wide is the duck boat? I don't know how wide the duck boat is. How big fits there now? Uh, taxis and buses, uh, that's something that, you know, local enforcement. They're, they're going to have to be made to pull in properly. That's all we can do. Uh, u turn. well, they're going to have some uh, immediate restrictions. <coughs> so that'll uh, negate the U-turns, hopefully. And bike riding, well, that's what we're trying to do. Enhance the bike uh, riding uh, <coughs> by giving two five-foot lanes, which is the standard currently. Yep. And, uh, we anticipate that there will be quite a, a lot of uh, bike riding going on. Can you put a curb on the left side of the bike lane? Put, put the bike lane between the sidewalk and where the cars go. Put a curb so they you can't get uh, can't get knocked off. Yeah, that's called the cycle track. That's something we're looking into. But given the cross section at this particular location and the excessive pedestrian volumes, we've looked at this and we cannot put a curb there. Can you put a rumble strip? One at a time, please. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, Could I have your name, please? Dorothea Haas, H-A-S-S. -S. Yes. I'm with Watt Boston. And in general, I want to say, I think this is an improved design. I especially like the elimination of the turn from North Washington Street onto Causeway 
because I was nearly killed coming to a public hearing earlier by someone taking the left at that intersection. Um, but I, I, so I, I think this is, these are positive changes. Um, I, I'm wondering in terms of, of the bike lanes, perhaps it would be possible to put, um, and the, I, I yield to the bicyclists on this, but perhaps there can be just uh, a rumble strip that would not throw the bicyclists off balance, but just there'd be an acoustical or um, a sensory feeling um, between the um, vehicle lanes and the bike lane. That might be helpful. That's an interesting point. I will take that into consideration. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, um, John Allen, um, bicycling advocate, um, presently unaffiliated, but interested. Uh, I just, I would um, echo Mr. Zaka's comments about issues with um, bicycling on the street. And furthermore, I would say that if bike lanes, to see how well bike lanes work when they're adjacent to taxi stands and commercial parking, you only need to go to Central Square in Cambridge or Kenmore Square in Boston and basically, it, it, it just, it doesn't work. My suggestion is here that um, in some parts of this project you have shared lane markings and that that, along with the slowing of the traffic that you are, uh, you are proposing would be a better solution than attempting to squeeze in bike lanes next to commercial parking where the bike lanes are next to the curb, you don't have that problem. Um, and just one uh, aside on this, this is a, it's a difficult location. You have all kinds of constraints. You're doing the best you can, but also um, I know that there's supposed to be an overpass over the railroad tracks um, on the Boston side of the river, and that is where the bicyclists who are too timid to ride Causeway Street will be able to get through this area. So I, I realize that's not this project, but it certainly is, is closely related. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen, uh, and thank you also for noting that that is not part of this project. And uh, we'll, we'll look at those uh, comments. Thank you. Yes, the back map. I'm Jane Forrestal, F-O-R-R-E-S-T-A-L-L. -L. I'm a resident of West End Place, which you pointed out in your uh, discussion. One of the things, if you go back to the area where West End Place is shown, um, that intersection of Plumasby, Causeway, Staniford, and Merrimack Streets. Um, I, West End Place has 183 residential units. We have about 75 to 80 children under the age of 18. We also have numerous, myself included, senior citizens. There's nothing there that shows where the, the ride can stop, the various school buses can stop, the, the Peapod delivery trucks can stop, Federal Express, the ride, and all of those different um, amenities that we now have. There's no accommodation for any of that in front of West End Place. Also, cab stands, there's no place where if somebody is coming in by cab or going out by cab, there's no place for them to stop and pick people up or drop people off. Uh, it's difficult as it is now because we've got a 10 minute parking space that's just a little bit up from where this project shows, I believe, which is usually parked in by people who are going shopping over or going to lunch or going someplace else. It's not uh, available a lot of the time. Plus, we have a lot of handicapped parking and we have a lot of handicapped residents who are in need of a place that's right near, as close to the front door as they can possibly get. And I see that you've got some plantings in there, and I, I can just see them being trampled as people jaywalk across that corner as we've been doing already. Thank you, uh, Ms. Farstall. Uh, currently, you mentioned there is a 10-minute section for- yes, of one parking space, yes. Is that on Stanford or is that yes, on the Yes, it's on Stanford, yep. Generally, we are providing parking along Lamaston for this whole stretch, and also along Stan Staniford. The only place that we're not allowing that to occur is in the intersection itself. Which is exactly where it needs to be. That we need to have, that's where people need to be picked up. 
picked up and dropped off, especially school children, because they, when they sit in the lobby of our building, parents go down to the sidewalk with their children. If it's bad weather, they wait within the vestibule. They can't see what's on the side. They can only see what's in the front of the building. Unfortunately, at, at the intersection, that apex is the most dangerous spot to stop. Oh, I know. So I think we are adding parking on the left-hand side. I think we're going to have to work with the management of the uh, of the uh, facility to find a, a spot that will accommodate not only the buses but for deliveries, but just be bought and taxis, etc. We have no place for that. We well, I, we just created some on the bonds. It looks like there's enough space for at least five vehicles there. But not for school buses. We'll we'll work with the city, Boston Transportation Department. There's some representatives here now. Yeah. Uh, and we can work with them on signage for school buses. And the ride. At, and the ride okay. at the peak uh, you know, times of the day when when, uh, when it's necessary. And we also have ambulances that come in like in and out of Certainly, yes, yeah. absolutely. I think you brought up a very valid point. Thank you. Yes, the way back, sir. Well, I'm Chris Mahar. I'm at HDR. I represent Dollar North Companies, the owner of the Garden. Garden site. We've been working with the city for many years on this plan, and I just wanted to point out that there, some of the things have advanced, certainly since uh, we acquired the North Station Garage for long-term lease, and there was been a long planned parking uh, ramp, access ramp to that garage uh, that uh, runs parallel with Legend Way. That doesn't show on this plan. We've had discussions with the city about advancing the construction of that. So I want that noted that uh, we're planning on constructing that ramp. And we've also had concerns about the median over the course of the time that we've worked on this, on this project. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the main issue with the median is access in and out of our, uh, out of our site for large vehicles we do run large television trucks in and out of Legends Way, what used to be Akron Way, and uh, there's large vehicles that currently enter and exit the garden site and in the future design uh, the, the possibility of a large loading, uh, loading facility on the garden site. So the median could impact access and egress of those large trucks into those locations. Okay, I got Chris, um, you bring up some valid points. We're going to take a look at that access egress at uh, Legend Way. And we'll have to have further discussions on that. Okay. That's an important uh, aspect. Yes, ma'am. And Lus, L-U-S-K, Harvard School of Public Health. I know you mentioned at the beginning that there are many pedestrians in this area and not many bicyclists. It could be suggested that there are currently not many bicyclists because it's not favorable to bicycling. If you put in bike lanes, which are now the popular facility to put in because they're easy and they don't really widen the road and people can double park in them and drive in them, you will find, as John Cooper found, that the rates of male bicyclists have gone up in the US, and the rates of female bicyclists have leveled, and the rates of child bicyclists have dropped sharply. Research by Reed Ewing suggested that bike lanes make the road safer for car drivers, for pedestrians, and make the road less safe for bicyclists. Research that we conducted in Montreal suggested that cycle tracks, very protected bicycle exclusive paths beside the sidewalks, have a 28% lower injury rate and 2.5 times as many bicyclists. The cycle tracks also accommodate women, children, and seniors and parents with children on their bicycles. New York City, on the cycle tracks we recently studied on 1st Avenue, 2nd Avenue, 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue, and then Prospect Park West, showed that significantly more bicyclists were bicycling on the roads. Traffic was calmed. There was lower mobile source air pollution. And you had 
fewer pedestrian crashes and fewer car bike crashes and also fewer vehicle vehicle crashes. Far more research articles are now being produced about cycle tracks. And we encourage you to please look at this corridor again to be at pace with the rest of the nation. Cycle tracks are being built in cities all across the US, including New York City and Chicago and San Francisco. We would be very backward if we only put in bike lanes and we would only accommodate a few bicyclists. You have, what, 18, 20 foot wide sidewalks. You have put a bike lane that is five feet wide in the road with the cars. If you want, we can easily sit down with you and look at the cross sections of the street and show you how to accommodate bicycles. Finally, if you look at the locations where you put all the green and the trees, there's no health benefit from having that much greenery, but there are staggering health benefits from enabling more people to bicycle. Even more health benefits from bicycling than from walking. Please consider cycle tracks. Thank you, comments. We will do that. Uh, I have read lots of uh, uh, material on, on psychotrack myself. I'm very familiar with it. Yes, ma'am. My name is Christine Savage, S A V A G E. I'm a resident at 234 Causeway Street. Um, my concerns are principally with the key square end of things. Um, the design and plans do not reference the Victor or the other residential buildings that are now being built, which also include a hotel. Um, and how the traffic associated with the additional residential parking that are being accommodated in those buildings will be handled. As it stands now, if you come out of the Beverly Street extension, there is a lane marker that says you can only turn right, which forces you to travel down Causeway Street, which is not the easiest um, way to get traffic um, into downtown or out of the neighborhood if people are heading north. They then end up driving and pulling up any number of intersections and having to drive through the new pedestrian sections that you're trying to accommodate. Um, in addition, uh, as you travel northeast, this particular plan shows that two of the lanes would be designated as left turn over the North Washington Street Bridge, with only one lane designated to go either straight or to the right. Um, that does not take into account the fact that there is a veterans assistance um, program that operates on the southeast side of that street. Um, there are- Sorry, can you just say that again? Uh, lane the lane use looks like it's two lanes to go north to Charlestown, and one that turns onto North Washington Street headed towards the tunnels or into the financial district. From Causeway Street. From Causeway Street. Correct, it's a double left. Right, so the problem with that is there are, at any given time, during you know, from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m., one or two vans from the ride or other types of services that are picking up or dropping off people that are handicapped um, those drop-offs and pick-offs are not quick, so you may have that lane completely blocked for up to five minutes. So the idea that one, a bike is going to be able to travel on it means now you've got a bike that wants to go straight or right in a left turn only lane, which does not strike me as particularly safe. Um, if, if they maintain that you can only turn left out of the Beverly Street extension requirement, it means that if I want to go straight or to the right, the likelihood is that the traffic on any given intersection isn't even going to let me, you know, mm -hmm. you, if you could turn left, you wouldn't be able to because the traffic's gonna be blocked too far back. Um, we already have a no turn on red signal there, which is gonna make it even worse. Uh, that actually I think has made it more dangerous for pedestrians because the only time we can turn right is when the pedestrians are also crossing the street and so people sort of game the system. They watch one or two people go from one end and they try to sneak their car to the right before the pedestrians coming from the other direction make their crossing. Um, from, Causeway Street, from Causeway Street onto North Washington. Which is one of the things that is being looked at by the city and it was part of Central Area mitigation is that Bedford Street today runs towards Causeway Street. And changing that direction will actually be horrendous because well, that's the one way that those of us who live in the Causeway building can actually get home without going through the TD Garden traffic on any night when something is happening. And if we can't turn left from North Washington Street, now the only way for me to get home without driving through the TD Garden traffic area is to go all the way around Commercial Street, which is gonna be a five minute detour for anyone living in that area. And it's not only gonna to apply to that building, it's also gonna hurt the people 
building, a hotel, or some place else. Some of the things that it does do is it solves all the other issues that you were talking about with the conflicts because, you know, if you can have traffic run down Medford Street instead of taking that right around that corner. Only if I can turn left out of my street, which I can't do. So that, that, I think that's got to get changed. The no turn on red's got to get changed. And I would leave Medford Street the way it is. Or if you're going to change the direction, you need to provide another avenue by which we can get to Beverly Street Extension without having to go through you know, the garden traffic. The uh, no turn on red is a uh, city uh, sign. They, they regulate that. And city Public Works and Boston Transportation are here. They hear your concern and we'll work with them to see if we can figure out something. Uh, I do understand the Veterans Administration has a lot of vehicles that come in. I've observed that myself. Uh, they also have another entrance on North Washington Street for the same building. Perhaps we can work with that group uh, to see if we can find some way to accommodate the uh, amount of uh, patrons who utilize those services. Uh, I think that's a valid concern. I'm glad you uh, highlighted that. Uh, and the other issues, uh, I guess we have to sit down with the city and just you know, find out some of these works in the, uh, the current flow of traffic in that area. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> My name is Anna Frateroli. It's um, spelled F is in Frank, R-A-T-T-A-R-O-L-I. We own the property at the corner of North Washington and Causeway, Endicott and Causeway. Um, we also own and operate restaurants there. And aside from our own personal views about extending Endicott Street um, and making it straight, which we don't support. Um, the bigger issue for me right now is just the how dangerous that intersection is, and I'm not convinced that any of the changes that you have proposed are going to mitigate that. Um, as a property owner that's in that building um, at least six or seven, eight hours a day, and who has personally called an ambulance for countless people that have been hit, at that intersection, I think speeding across that intersection is a big problem. I think people running for their lives is a big problem. I don't see how straightening that crosswalk um, is going to solve it. I can see you doing a wider sidewalk. Some of the things that you're talking about doing um, directly in front of the garden, but you're not doing in front of us. Um, so my concerns are, I'm really kind of disappointed in the plan at this point. Okay, we are uh, interconnected the signalization of the effort. Well, the, the, the signalized system is, you know, this intersection is coordinated with the other signals throughout the corridor and a lot of throughout Washington Street. But, I mean, to, to speak to the safety of that intersection right now, I mean, the traffic coming out of there today is unregulated. And this has them go under their own signal phase. So it is a much safer situation getting out of that out of that uh, uh, Endicott Street than it is today, absolutely. Um, the crosswalks up here, you know, again, we're shortening the crosswalks and we're providing more pedestrian area in that corner to help with that situation that you mentioned. So I don't think we're creating a less safe situation. I certainly think, you know, this is a safer and a uh, more understandable situation for both vehicles and pedestrians at that, at that location. Um, you also oppose the straightening of it. Any particular reason why you? Oppose well, it? at this point, um, just this is new to me that it's being proposed to straighten it. I'd be interested to hear what other residents and business owners about us on Endicott Street feel about it. Um, I don't know if it's been discussed in the North End, um, and so I'm interested to hear what others think about it. We currently have a um, delivery area where we accept deliveries for our restaurant, and that would be affected. But again. You know, as a business owner, um, property owner, my biggest concern is the speed at which vehicles come across that intersection. Um, I've seen people run for their lives. I've seen people hit. Um, and I just don't see how speed is being addressed um, and how it's any more pedestrian friendly to any great extent. I understand that you're making changes, but I don't see it's really to any great extent. Well, to the best of our ability, we try to uh, design it uh, geometrically um, limit the speeds, but it's really an enforcement issue on a local level. That's all we can do is, you know, we try to do what we can with the signals, pavement marking, signage. But the speed, speed issue is, is really something that has to be enforced with the city level. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Dwayne Lusher. I'm the executive director at the West End Museum. We're in Butter. 
L U C I A. We're in a butter on Lamazny Way. We're in the 100, uh, 150 Stanford Street building. We have about 150 uh, a linear feet of storefront. And I uh, had a couple of questions. One, uh, let's see. Uh, does the federal aid mandate a portion of the funding to be spent on arts and culture, particularly in the historical sense? And how will that, uh, if there is a, a portion of that A mandated towards culture and historical content, how is that uh, fitted out for contract. My second question is what will, you know, what measures will be taken along Lamazny Way right in front of 150 Stanford Street there, which is our front door to uh, mitigate the construction impacts. And then um, the last, I, I want to support the bicycle, having the bicyclist money more or less my whole life and I have a uh, son who's a bicyclist as well. Um, I had originally mentioned to Guy and Jonathan about maybe putting bicycle lanes uh, along the median, but I, I, having been to Japan and seen bike tracks and seen 200 bicycles every other block, and I'm all for that. You know, if you can, if you can make that happen. Okay, uh, great. Uh, federal aid, I know there's no uh, earmarks mandate for this particular project to have some type of arts culture. We are putting what we can as far as enhancements for the uh, project, you know, uh, both landscaping and there's uh, some uh, enhancements to the type of pavement, markings, and things of that nature, but no cultural um, per se. Um, as far as mitigating uh, construction impacts, um, access and egress is going to be um, insured for every, every uh, storefront, every <coughs> residence. Our resident engineer will be on site to work with anybody who has any concerns on, say, deliveries or any access issues. Um, if there's an issue that comes up on site, then we'll, we'll take care of it. But you know, beyond that, we don't have any plan to mitigate, and we don't really want to you know, plan on uh, negatively affecting anyone's business or life. Um, and uh, I do uh, have noted again that we do support the bikes on the median. I've never seen that uh, particular type of uh, cross section. I don't think we're going to apply that, that concept. Right, yeah. Not a median, not a median like that, no. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I, my name is Keith Bauer, B-A-U-E-R, uh, and I work on Friend Street, so I bike down Causeway Street every day, and I want to speak in support of the people who talk about the inadequacies of bike lanes that are running right alongside parked cars uh, and taxi cabs. Uh, I've been blocked many times as I bike down Causeway Street coming to work. I've been cut off. Um, I've never been to work because I bike far enough out from the parked cars, which means if there were bike lanes, I probably would not be in them. I'd be outside of the bike lanes uh, and where the, the traffic is. In any case, Causeway Street is, as you commented before, an extremely wide street, and it is a perfect place to be putting in cycle tracks uh, because there's plenty of room for sidewalk and cycle tracks with uh, uh, motor vehicles outside those spaces, and then bicycles could move through safely without fear of being doored or being cut off or being blocked. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the uh, we cannot get a cycle track in this cross-section because the uh, excessive amount of pedestrians for both the uh, travel node and well station and for events at the garden. But, you know, something we're looking at. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I have... Oh, I'm sorry. Louise Thomas, 
I'm going to reiterate what Jane said for a couple of reasons. Jane Forrest saw it was in place. But I think that the parking in front of, um, of West End Place is probably a lot better than along the last way. The last way right now at 2 o'clock, it's backed up all the way almost to Mockingbird. Okay? So I don't understand how you can. There's a lot of traffic all the time. It's currently no parking on the land. That is correct. And it and, back and we are providing with this design. <laughs> well, you are. Yes. But and I, what I'm saying is that I don't think that's a good idea. Because the traffic backs up. At 2 o'clock, it's backed up almost all the way to the middle of the house. Right. One of the things we're doing, I mean, that wouldn't be used as a travel lane. So would be bumped out, so this would be the parking in here, and it would be bumped out, so the traffic would be out of the parking lane. So, I mean, you'd still, I believe, be able to get access to the parking lane, just like any other city street. Okay, but I really would like you to look at it. The other thing that I'm really curious about, because I know that with all of the Wolf and Triangle projects, that the city of Boston, I don't think wants me to ask this but I heard that you were going to donate, you were getting donations also for this project. How much money are you getting from the city of Boston? Um, Jonathan, really, um, there is a, there's a number of development projects. There's the Avenir, there's the, the Victor project, there's the Murano, there's also future development scenarios for the Boston Garden site, as well as the National Street Residences, as well as the, um, the Garden Garage project, which is in the West End. All of those will have a dollar per square foot contribution to the uh, to the Acosta Street project. So we envision a, a combination of funding sources from private developers, from the city of Boston, and hopefully from the state of federal aid. Also, let me just make one point, just to clarify something earlier. Um, one of you referenced all the future development scenarios. All of the future traffic scenarios, including pads, bikes, um, vehicular access points, have been taken into account with this design. So we have looked at, we have done a lot of modeling based on the five, 10 year build out of the entire area. That includes something as large as two 400 foot towers um, and 800 cars, um, and 800 car parking garage on the former Boston Garden site, which is as, was allowed as a zoning. So we have done that kind of analysis ahead of time. And in terms of the Medford Street conversation, one of the things we've mentioned is that we know that Medford Street is, is proposed to go a different way. I think that as we continue to design forward, looking at how Medford Street works is something that we are very aware of, but it's, it's, it's something that there's pros and cons in each direction. So just want to address that. Can I ask a question? How have you done the modeling uh, on could the Could you tell us your name, please? And, and Musk, Could you tell us how you did the yes, modeling? Yes, I'm just trying to keep warning you. And Musk, could you tell us how you did the modeling for the bicycles? And did you then you model it to show increases in women, children, and seniors, and parents with children on their bicycles, or just a bicycle, which is a male bicycle? How did you do your modeling? And did you then create more bicycle space, or just a five-foot bike in the road? Well, you have to understand that when we took our traffic volumes for bicycles here, yes. we had very few bicycles. Why? So, because it's an unfriendly situation yes. today. Yes. And so we're trying to make that much better by adding some accommodations for bicyclists. To, there is no modeling that you can do to differentiate between male or female or child bicyclists. I mean, we try to accommodate all bicyclists. We assume that some bicyclists will be on the sidewalk. That's, you know, that, that happens. It, you know, it's not something we're designing for, but, you know, people sometimes feel safer bicycling on the sidewalk. And if it's a small child or family, that's what you'll see out there probably. We're trying to also provide for some accommodation in the roadway as well. For people that don't want to impact pedestrians or be impacted by pedestrians, we're providing those specific accommodations in the roadway. So we're both widening the sidewalk to help hopefully you know, accommodate pedestrians better and as a side effect will help some bicyclists, I'm sure. Not that we're trying to encourage it, but you know, we're trying to you know, take a complete streets approach at this. Putting a cycle track in the sidewalk and having thousands of pedestrians cross that cycle track is not a safer design in my opinion. No one's suggesting we put it in the sidewalk. 
Sir, can I have your name, please? Uh, we, we, don't, we don't speak up. Could you stand up and give us your name, please? Uh, I'm Pete Stiven. I'm the, the director of the Boston Cyclist Union. And uh, I was just making uh, the point that uh, cycle tracks take many forms. You know, have to put it in the middle of the sidewalk, like it is over on Bassett Street, that has proved a, a popular. Um, it actually, in your plan, as it exists, uh, in some of the small stretches, you could actually just raise the bike lane into a level that's in between the sidewalk and the street, and then that would be physically protected enough to be a cycle track. Um, but I also wanted to, uh, to the gentleman on, my, on the left there taking the notes, sir, officiating the meeting, what was your name? My name's Albert Miller, I'm the project manager. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to see if we could maybe remove the word can't from the vocabulary, mm -hmm. because I think that it is possible we, we actually, uh, Peter Firth, a professor at Northeastern, and I met with the city uh, with a plan at hand for how it could, the cross-section could work here very possible. I, I, I think it's especially possible if we had the support of uh, TD North with the enormous sidewalk there um, and then you know we could maybe be able to get some people to the game. Um, but uh, you know I mean I think if you're you know this is a place where a lot of families come for outings they go to the, the games and hockey game the basketball game and all that and not to mention the North Station major hub and if you just walk outside you see uh, tons of bikes parked and uh, bike parking, and actually one of our members asked me to uh, bring that up, um, that we need a lot more bike parking in this area. Um, but uh, we put a notice out about this meeting, and we've since heard from several uh, workers in the area that also feel that this street needs uh, a stronger facility, and I think you know, if we work together, uh, we have a lot of talent, in, in, our, in the bike community, including engineers and uh, urban planners, we could come up with a good solution for this, and I, I invite you guys to work with us. All right, thank you, Paul, for your comments. Uh, for your comments. Um, as the city design advances, we'll, we'll take those comments into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Steve Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R. And I work with Livable Streets Alliance. And I want to say that it's impressive that you've done a lot of thinking and been uh, pushing as far as you can. I think you can push further. And this is good, but Boston should get great. There's a couple of key moments and functions of this area that I was a little sorry that I didn't hear you talk about. One is there is that 15, 20 minutes when the game's let out where the circus lets out. That's a special moment. And I think we should think of this area being treated specially at those moments. Essentially, give it to the pedestrians. You try to control them to climb over the fence. It's not possible. So I think there should be some thought, working with the city of Boston, about making this a pedestrian priority location for 15, 20, half an hour, right around the point where games or events let out as opposed to when they're coming in, people come in one at a time, everybody leaves at the same time. So that's one way to not have to design something to deal with that, which is only a short time of the day. The second piece I think that's really important and not sufficiently addressed here is the fact that this is the gateway from the Rose Kennedy Greenway to the river. We're spending a lot of money on making that river beautiful. Important not just for tourists, but it's also a major route for people who want to get off the roads. I wish there was a little more thought of how to make that connection in this process so that it would be smooth, both for people coming from the Greenway to the river, but also for people coming from the Greenway in downtown into Charlestown. We're about to have probably cycle tracks or really enhanced bicycle facilities all through Charlestown and then trails heading north. You're about to see bicycle jams on those streets. This is not the place in the middle of this intersection you want to have that jam occur. Another small point. Um, it's great that you're adding trees. I love trees. I was really excited to hear that you were also widening the sidewalks. But it sounds like most of the widening is not going to pedestrians. It's going to the green space, which is nice, but not really the primary mission here. 
I think you should think about having narrower planters, or maybe even occasional planters, and utilizing that space either for pedestrians or, and this is where I'll start echoing other people, for some cycle tracks. There are a lot, I was a little sorry to see that the vision of what a cycle track is, is pretty narrow here. So there's a lot of different designs, whether they be full cycle tracks with curves, or rolling curves, or slightly elevated spaces, or buffered spaces, or places with removable bollards. All of those can accommodate emergency vehicles. All of those, I mean, not, the, not the hard curve, but the soft curve, the, the raised space, and the bollards, provide the, the flexibility for the kinds of big trucks coming in when they need to come, a whole bunch of other things. It really is a dangerous space to put and try to put families on the road next to some of the cabs. Yes, it is enforcement, but the structure of the street changes people's behaviors. We've got to make sure that the families coming in and out of the garden and walking back and forth on that street are safe as we can structurally make. Yes, there's enforcement, but the first step is the structure. Is the structure. I was also disappointed that the bicycle facilities and the pedestrian facilities are not extended all the way to North Washington. Several people have talked about that is a dangerous intersection. People are moving very fast through there. It's a good thing that you're narrowing it, but I think trying to put bikes, as uh, Mr. Bauer recently said, into the road going in front of the Veterans Association place, it's a death trap. Someone's going to get hit. There is no way you can bicycle on a shared lane without getting into the wrong lane and having somebody scream at you. You've got enough road rage, let's not provoke further. I also think we need to think of the continuation of the bicycles through both sides of the intersections, both at uh, what was it? Lowell Square and Keeney Square. I never heard it called Lowell Square, it's nice. So I think right now you've done a better job of improving the pedestrian crossing, and that's desperately needed. But I don't think the bicycle intersections are as clear or as safe. And you really need to think about maybe separate lights for bicycles, or suggested paths through those intersections for bicycles, dotted lines, or colored lines. But as it is now, you're sort of dumping people from a bike lane with its own problems into an intersection with too many problems. And I think you, you need to step up on that one a little bit more. Um, Finally, I think you need to remember, in terms of the bike lanes and the pedestrian facilities, that North Station is a major hubway station. It's got one of the most active hubway uh, facilities. And I don't know if you're following the news today, but uh, hubway has already reached 300,000 trips. This is like a year ahead of schedule. This is just going to do nothing but grow. North Station is the place you come in on the commuter train, you grab your bike, and you bike to your work. That's what it's designed to be. We're going to have a lot of people who are not uh, advanced bicyclists getting on those rental bikes and going through the section. I think, again to echo other people, structuring this so that we minimize the danger going from bikes to pedestrians to cars to buses to the ride will be a huge improvement. You've done some. I think you can do even more. Great, thank you. You have uh, quite a lot there. Uh, again, this is, we're at 25%. We're going to be working out some of these comments and trying to improve the design where we can. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Mark Tedra. Um, I'm a local streets alliance. Uh, I'm, I'm a member of the um, 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 advocacy committee. Last name is TEDRW. Try not to repeat what Steve said. Um, one, uh, getting bicycle uh, facilities from one end of Cosway to the other um, is possible. I understand that it's tight on uh, the Kikini Square side. You eliminate one travel lane, you have plenty of room. Uh, but you're courageous enough to do that. Um, two, the over, uh, over at Lowell Square, the turn to get from Cosway, the, the double left turn to get from Cosway Street to Merrimack Street. Um, Right now, the way it's shown, unless you're a very aggressive cyclist, 
There's no way you're going to make that turn. I'm sorry, where? Going from, oh, by the way. Your plan is if you keep them all oriented in the same direction, well, throughout, it would be nice. Uh, that's why I kind of pointed you, because we're trying, okay. to, trying to load up as big right. as you can. Yeah, if you go up, go west on Cosmo Street, up, up head to Cosmo Street, take the left onto Long Kamaze, then make another left onto Merrimack Street. Yes. As a cyclist uh, doing that in traffic, that's that's going to require some aggressive bike. Um, if, if, you know, if there, I've heard, heard a suggestion that you could perhaps do a jug handle where the uh, where the trees are uh, for, for, for for cyclists to get them facing the correct direction and have them and uh, I'm not a walk signal or a traffic signal. You know, uh, I'm getting across the mall, they get on the Merrimack. That's one way to do it. Perhaps an advanced stop line. Um, there, there's, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a light. I don't think there's a light. Um, then back uh, for pedestrian crossings at Brendan Canal Street. Um, are there going to be uh, uh, are there going to be crosswalk six uh, crosswalk signals there? Yes. Um, is, are there going to be countdown uh, timers on there so people will no longer no you know just how long you have to wait? Yes. All right. Um, Yeah, somewhere in the way back there, sir. Scott Nogueira, N-O-G-U-E-I-R-A. I'm a resident on Causeway Street, property owner. Uh, I've walked down Causeway Street, parts of it at least, about uh, 10 times a day. I've had my car on it for the last decade. Um, I'd like to echo the first gentleman's comments. I thought one of, one of the best all evening. Your design does not reflect reality of what goes on on Causeway Street. Your curb utilizations are almost 100% wrong for reality. You have, I think, no, no taxi stand in front of the uh, garden, which is also North Station. If you look at South Station, there's taxi stands and drop-off zones on both sides of South Station. We have a similar station here, apparently no place to drop off. You didn't take into account the Dunkin' Donuts, where numerous ambulances and police vehicles and truck drivers, and everybody stops for two minutes to run in to get their coffee and donut. But there's no way to do that. Instead, you have ridiculously wide sidewalks, planters that nobody is looking for, that had no value. Instead of accommodating traffic flow through the neighborhood, 7-Eleven, all these people stop, double park all the time. You've got to give them a little bit of space to do that. If you guys are taking the space away, from how the curve is utilized. And what you're going to result in is bicyclist problems, double parking, traffic jams. Uh, I'd like to also echo what Jane Forrestal said and Louise about in front of West End Place. There is a huge sidewalk area there that is wasted that could be set up as a, uh, a pull-in or a drop-off area. Um, also, what my neighbor from Strata said about the Veterans Hospital across the street from 234 Causeway. There is 100% of the time at least two vehicles parked in the roadway there. So instead of accommodating that usage, you guys are just ignoring it. And that's exactly what everybody does. You also mentioned the phrase enforcement. If you're going to leave it to enforcement, frankly, I think we're screwed because there's no enforcement going on. <laughs> Lastly, uh, John uh, currently here, Lad, over here talking about the traffic study. My understanding is there has been no traffic study done during garden events, which I think is ridiculous as a garden event, one third of the nights of the year, that accommodates for huge parking problems and traffic problems in the neighborhood. So if you're gonna cite traffic studies, you ought to do one that focuses on what happens in this neighborhood during garden events, because I gotta tell you, it's a horn honking, double parking, traffic nightmare, and your plan, as I said, is not taking any of that into account, is really, quite frankly, not gonna help my life in this neighborhood. Thank you, Scott. Um, uh, we, have <laughs> we have done some studies during events uh, to determine uh, some of the volumes. And we have taken those volumes into account with the design. Yes, I can't see you there? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, my name is Gary Hammer, H-A-M-M-E-R. Um, I live in West End Place, and I want to, first of all, just quickly echo some of the comments that have been made already about the provision of adequate pickup and drop-off zones. I think that's really critical. I think without it, we're going to have a situation of people double parking and just stopping the travel lane, which you see in other parts of the city, and I think it's going to exacerbate the congestion problems we already have. Um, secondly, something that hasn't been mentioned, I hope the, the plan is going to include some improved wayfinding and directional signage at the various intersections, uh, both for, for vehicular travel and for pedestrians. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've been stopped and asked, where is the garden, where is the science museum, where is the National General, where is Government Center? And I think um, some people shy away from that because they think it's going to turn into looking like a highway interchange, but I think there are some ways to do it in an appropriate way that will um, actually improve people's experience of, of the intersection. So, thank you. Great, that was a good comment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Sarah Freeman, F-R-E-E-M-A-N. Um, I'm wearing a number of hats today. I work in public health on a study looking at the uh, benefits of physical activity and chronic disease prevention. Um, that's a long way of saying I'm a big fan of the bike network concept. Uh, this project is being called a reconstruction. Bike lanes are something that are easy to do if you're not doing a very ambitious project on a street. You can sort of paint them in and, and you're done. If you call it a reconstruction, I encourage you to seize the opportunity to really make something safe. Some of the designs Steve mentioned, uh, Causeway at Lowell Square and Keeney Square, if I, as a timid 60 plus year old cyclist, ooh, did I say that part again? <laughs> Sorry, uh, senior cyclist, if I see a blue line that comes and goes, I'm not biking there. You wouldn't build a road like that, you wouldn't build a sidewalk like that. It's, if it can be done, it deserves consideration. I apologize for coming into this late. I realize it's been going on. Just out of curiosity, when did you write the purpose? How many years ago? I think the city began this about six years ago. Because the climate, it's a different world now. It's been defined over the years. Thank you. Um, and thank you for pointing out the purpose. I read it pretty closely. Uh, you and applaud the uh, goal of a great pedestrian oriented boulevard, pedestrian friendly place. The word bike wasn't even on the radar. Boston has done a 180 in six years. There wasn't the hubway. The idea of families and tourists or visitors coming here and getting a bike and saying, uh oh, <laughs> I'm not biking here. It's like we need, if you build it, it'll get used. Um, I have to say, I mean, I agree with you. In that sense, you know, when we first started this project, it's a 2006 job number for me, so it was 2006, I think, when we started this job, and our first plans had no bike combination because it wasn't on anyone's. Mm -hmm. it was, it's a new world. You no, know, over the time though, we've met with Nicole Friedman, who I'm sure you know, many, many times on this project, and she has worked with us to help come to this design. Um, you know, and so. It's a big step forward, and I don't think any of us are saying that we can't look at making improvements to this plan. That's why we're here, Thank to you. listen to you and to make improvements to this plan. I'll meet with whoever I need to meet with to help see where we can make accommodations. Thank you. Uh, but I, you know, I, I have to say it's a pretty good plan that accommodates all of the users, and you know, maybe there are opportunities to make it better. That's it. Maybe even better. People have mentioned tonight, like maybe put the bikes inside the planters or make narrower planters or, or you know, they're just be, be bold. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. My name's David Lyons, last name L Y O N S. Uh, I live in the West End. I actually am a frequent Hubway rider. I take the Hubway from the South Station rather than having to change the orange line uh, to get home. So I'll ride it down to North Station and drop it off at North Station because I'm afraid to bike on Causeway Street. And I can tell you that based on how Boston drivers drive and Boston cab drivers drive, I would be equally afraid to bike on Causeway Street based on your plan. Um, without a dedicated 
bicycle area that a taxi does not have to cross, it's going to be very unsafe for me, a 46-year-old, much less a child or someone in their 60s or whatever, to bike. And to give you an example, we've just talked about the change that's happened from 2006 to today. We have the Hubway today, I think, or yesterday, just increased in size by 50%. You have the most used station here in North Station, and it's a very difficult station to get to and from depending on what side of the city you are on. The system is doubling, its, not doubling, it's going up in size by 50% in one year. Uh, I don't know what your projections are, but I really encourage you to see if you can work with the very knowledgeable bicyclists in this, in, that we're lucky enough to have in Boston to advocate for this so that it would be easier for me to take my hubway from South Station to North Station, I bike along the Greenway, it's a nice bike ride, they put in some nice bike paths. And then I could zip up Cottage Way Street, park my hubway in front of Whole Foods, and have a cup of coffee before I go home. That would be awesome, and if you do this right, I'll be able to do it. So thank you for trying. Thank you for watching. Yes, ma'am. Um, Jane Farstall, just a quick clarification there's that it hasn't been mentioned at all in the handout there's mention of taking property whether it be permanent or temporarily and I was wondering if you had any ideas to what uh, where that might be or if it was where it might be permanent where it might be temporary and for how long and when will the uh, one of those people be notified those owners okay uh, that's a right-of-way question uh, do we have any sense as to the easements? Okay, well, for the West End for place, the only easements we have to view are actually on the curb branch near the, near the garage entry. There's not enough for property on the public right away to have a proper curb ramp with double landing, so that's going to be a small area near your arm, mostly near the garage entry. Okay, but what about the rest of the, the sites? Actually, most, I would say all the permanent ones I think of are actually, like one is on Legend Way, I think that's the MBTA property once again for a curb ramp. Majority of them are temporary ones. We're trying to fix the sidewalk. We have to go to the business up to the up to the front door. And they have a little inlet that they actually own. So. So the only one that we're going to see near West End Place is the one that is at the back of the building near our, our driveway. Um, that's yeah, the one that is right there. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're contemplating another one. We saw these big planters in front, and we're actually considering maybe not taking that land now. So that'd be the only other one we could those plans. <coughs> That's a very big sidewalk. We're going to break it up. We're thinking of maybe just replacing your sidewalk in time with the concrete and brick. I'm sorry, I'm doing it again. I can't. I think in that area we might just be replacing your sidewalk in time if you disturb it with the concrete and the brick access strip. We're going to try to save your trees that are up there now. So, I hope so. Just so yeah, well, that's what I meant. So that's why you might be thinking those big plants to see the other side. All right, so you're not talking about taking large chunks of property. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Joanne Fantasia, lifelong resident on Washington Street. Um, the name is F. Frank A. N. T. A. S. I. A. And um, two things. On Memphis Street, it was originally from Causeway Street to North Washington Street. And when it was changed during the construction of the artery, um, I can't tell you how many accidents have been caused from people taking a left-hand turn from North Washington Street onto Memphis Street. Um, and if maybe if you made Beverly Street from Valente Way to Northbound, that would help the people at La Strada. I don't know. And my main concern is um, King Square. I would like to see pedestrians have their own crossing cycle. That would be the only way to save people's lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, I'm standing in the back. Uh, hi there. My name is Tom Bertillis. Last name is spelled B as in boy, E R T U L I S. I'm a uh, traffic engineer, resident of Boston. I've done with the TD Garden in Conway quite a bit. I use all modes of transport, so I'm quite familiar with I can't hear you, sir. Um, I come here quite a bit. I'm very familiar with 
lots of pedestrian activity, the conflicts that occur because of it. I noticed there's a theme, a lot of people talk about bicycles and, and uh, don't envy you guys, but maybe I can help you guys. I've been designing bike facilities and cycle tracks, European style cycle tracks, for more than 10 years now, including all across Europe, all across Latin America. I know you guys mentioned you haven't seen the median uh, bike rate design. I, I can show you lots of designs. Actually, they're very popular in Latin America. Happy to show you them. I've uh, been studying this Causeway Street design for the last year and a half. I actually took the liberty of doing the design. I'm happy to consult with you guys. Pro bono, of course. Uh, there's lots you can do. Lots you can do. You can do plastic wallets. You can just play around with the grade. You can put vegetation down. You can put it in the media. That should be an option. It's something we should talk about. You mentioned we're at 25%. I'm grateful for you to come to us at 25%. We can still play with it a little bit. Uh, I'm a licensed PE. I'm happy to put my stamp on it. So uh, let me know. I just I think a lot of people have mentioned let's not take it off the table. There's, there's a lot that can be done. People can come with their hubway and use the cycle tracks. So I'm happy to help. Thanks. Great. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, Dorothea has about Boston. And I just want to make two points. One is uh, I like the green greenery along here. I know there's been it. So, and let me say, Walk Boston works very closely with the bicyclists. We, we support them wholeheartedly. But this is a hard edged urban environment. And I think a little bit of greenery might soften that. Um, and and just add to the aesthetic overall. So I think there's room for all of this to, to occur, but I don't want us to forget about the green space. In this. And then I, I want to uh, just reiterate what uh, this woman has said, Fred, 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 Fred Oni, and someone else about um, Causeway in North Washington. Uh, cars are traveling very fast there. Uh, the sidewalks are narrow there. And the street corners because the buildings come up so close right. to, um, to the edge of the public way. And I just, I feel like there may also be some urban design solutions. I mean, part of it is the buildings, uh, some of the buildings at that intersection are fairly low. Um, so maybe we can have vertical elements that would visually narrow the street there. It feels like a highway when you're at North Washington about to go over the bridge. So I think that in addition to taking a look at the engineering uh, piece of it, uh, maybe the VRA and others can become involved and think of some way that that intersection fit in nice bigger design more than just a civil engineering traffic engineering piece of it to see if there's some way to slow vehicles there because it feels very much like a vehicle, not bicycles, not pedestrians, but a, a car. Um, environment and cars only in their kind of vision to see other cars and so they speak. So I hope something can be done there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good promise. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Al Khatib, A L I P K H A T I D. Please speak up. Okay. My name is Malik al khatib and I'm resident of the West End. Uh, I would believe, would like to comment on Broad Square. I would believe we would be needing a lot of uh, near to pedestrian signs, especially if the pedestrian crossing is not going to be exclusive or there is a cycle for pedestrians. By the time the car turns from one side to another to Merrimack or whatever, you are going to be needing the pedestrians crossing the street. The other element I would like to talk about is almost the end of your project since this is state and local funded or once you don't have to worry about the feds. If you can put the signs or the feds or the people coming from the garage would not go into that street straight and go around the block to come on National Street. Right now there is no sign while car coming from cars from Martha will turn and left to Nashua. They could be facing face to face without any side distance at the corner there with other cars. It's only the feds use it and some people coming from. 
That, that's right. People coming from the garage or the O'Neill building. No, the O'Neill building garage. Yeah. No? The other? South. South. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, People coming from there, turn left and then turn left along the line. That's, that's right. Right now, they are allowed to do it because there is no sign to make this piece of the street one way sign. So people would have to go down national. Correct. It's, it's just about less than 100 feet. Turn around and they'll come back. Okay. All right. But those who are making the left turn, it's very dangerous for them. The last thing, you know, the separation you are trying to create. So that jaywalkers will not cross the street, uh, the causeway. I think it's a waste of time and waste of money. If you just look at the people when they leave North Station, they are going to cross the street no matter what. They are going to walk to the median and keep on along the median until they find an opening that possible. So I have seen it in so many cosmopolitan areas and London and many places they are taking it out because it looks bad, it's trapped for the distance, the jaywalkers get stuck in the middle, they are going to continue on. It's either widen the median or let the people cross. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Any folks in the back that have any comments or questions? Okay, generally it seems like we're, we're rehashing the same comments of bike cycling. Uh, median pedestrians. Um, as I mentioned, this is uh, we're at 25 percent level. We are going to go back and take a look at these comments and look at where we can revise these as much as possible. I'll take additional comments if there's some new issues that you want to bring up. Yes, sir. I just want to one quick, quick one. My name is Eric Savage. I live on Causeway Street 34 Strada. Um, I like to clarification on that um, King Square. Uh, specifically the eastbound traffic um, so, uh, this is yeah uh, I guess going from top to bottom right uh, you have two left lanes um, and you have one lane for right hand turns onto North Bush and what lane is designated to go straight on Commercial Street? Right. It's not designated as right turn all the way to through right. So it's a through right. Right. Okay. Um, I think that. I think my input is that you should at least make the middle lane, in addition to a left hand turn, a straight. Uh, because what's going to happen is no one's either going to be able to go right or straight as in south, because between what someone mentioned before, I mean, if you stand out at any given day uh, between the drop-offs of the Veterans uh, Center across the street um, and the no right-hand turn, every 90 seconds there's cars honking, and between that and the pedestrians crossing, maybe two or three cars may be able to take a right-hand turn, let alone those people that would be able to go south, perhaps in east of the Fisher. Top to bottom on commercial street. So one of the um, issues that we have, unfortunately, with that is the receiving lanes. The width over there isn't wide enough. So it's not a comfortable like two receiving lanes. So we can narrow down to one lane right here. Yeah. The existing. You're only going to get one lane coming out of cause. Right? That's what I'm saying. He's yeah. asking well, for it. I would, yeah, I would also implore you know, the, the realities uh, of garden of egress. We got intoxicated fans spilling out like cattle. I don't know if at night they're going to be funneling in an orderly fashion across these uh, corridors, pedestrian corridors, let alone the traffic exiting is going to be a disaster because part of the problem is going to be the convergence of you know, pe people, cars, and now bikes. Um, you know, I won't even cover the bike aspect of it because I know it's emotional issue for everyone, but um, at least the, the, the traffic, you know, aspect that the goal is to get, get the traffic out of there, and that looks like a disaster. Um, you know, this particular intersection. Yes, just not to mention during rush hour, you got traffic coming 
you know, I don't know if you've stood there and actually watched it. Uh, yeah, we live there. We hear the honking every two minutes, and, and it sure is, and it's the same thing. People are like, what's going on? Why can't I turn right? These people are crossing, they can't make a right turn on red. In addition to that, you got people coming across the bridge from Charlestown, and, you know, you get an MBTA bus or something, and, and they're like, well, the light's, or, you know, yellow, and now it's red, but I think, and then they, they block the intersection, they just stop there. So several things are going on to restrict that eastbound traffic. And you know what that's gonna do, jack up, up the chain back towards you know those pedestrian following yeah, I mean, points we, near we conducted traffic studies both before and after events, most recently as you know maybe four of the Celtics this past year or one or four. Uh, the modeling of this lane use works. I understand the realities of things, you know, whether or not how you deal with event traffic and the deployment of deployment of police details to help flush traffic out. You know, it's all part of the event planning that I think the garden does. And you know, it's a plan that they'll probably have to revise in concert with the plan that we develop as part of this project. I hear I hear what you're saying. Yes, sir. I'm Phil Frateroli. Uh, I own the business at 289 Causeway Street. Can you spell your last name? F-R-A-T-T-A-R-O-L-I. Can you just talk a little bit about, you said um, the end of the car, it's going to be signals, how that's going to interact with the other signal? Can you swear? Right, so here's the phasing up here, and again, it's not our typical same area. And again, I was trying to squeeze as much out of the slide as I could here. So phase one is essentially the traffic coming off of North Washington Street southbound, traffic heading north on North Washington Street. And then you can see the pedestrian crossings on either side of Causeway Street and Commercial Street. Phase two, we shut off the northbound. We continue the through and right turn traffic southbound, and we add that phase coming out of Antipot Street, northbound, northbound to the right. The next phase that shuts off, we have commercial street, which moves to the right, uh, to the left, um, with uh, various pedestrian crossings. And then the following phase is all across the street, and the right turn from commercial, and you can see that pedestrian on the left, and we're talking about. And then the final phase is again all of North Washington Street. Southbound, this is the left turn. Now, with the blues and the, and the rights, so you can see the phase that follows. Again, come back and shut off the lefts and the rights, but the blues and the white crosses. So, with that, that approach is running during southbound, both Washington Street cruise. Yeah, and Lusk, L-U-S-K, I wanted to give you another design consideration. If as you do, if you do as Steve had suggested, and you make this a very signature area, hubway's coming, it's multimodal, you have a lot of families, you could consider installing a Chinese countdown bicycle signal. In the U.S., we have a red, yellow, and green bicycle. In China, they have a red and a green bicycle, and there's a number in the middle that is a countdown, so you have five, four, three, two, one in red numbers, and you know that time is for waiting before you then kick your pedal around and get ready to get through the intersection. So bicyclists can get through much more quickly. So do consider the Chinese bicycle countdown signal. That, again, would make this area very signature. And I know Nicole and added bike lanes. Remember, she is an Olympic bicyclist, and she also has indoor in the Boston range. Thank you, Ms. Yes, on the way back, sir. Hi, Scott Noguera, N-O-G-U-E-I-R-A. I spoke before, so I moved up standing over there. Uh, I'm trying to check in. I'm trying to check in. Uh, uh, while I was condemning uh, your curb usage, I did not note one positive thing, and that was the fact that you guys have added a crosswalk, it looks like, uh, going across uh, Causeway 
near Beverly uh, Street Extension, near Portal Park. I think it's very important. There are literally, by my count, thousands of jaywalking pedestrians every day going between Medford and Beverly and across Causeway. So I think that's a great addition. I'd encourage you to even consider, I don't remember what you called it, that uh, uh, the intersections at, at uh, Canal and Friend have that traffic slowing thing, yeah, that thing. Uh, maybe consider that even at the Beverly Street Extension intersection as well. Uh, we have that small crosswalk uh, because, like I said, there are literally thousands of people uh, jaywalking currently across that area. Um, my other question was, I was wondering if you could, I may have missed it at the very beginning, uh, if you could address why we're blocking off uh, the turning coming out of Canal Street and turning into French Street. Because I really think that's going to screw up the, uh, the businesses trying to get deliveries, uh, people driving around the neighborhood trying to find parking. Uh, we have a shortage of parking in that half of the Bullfinch Triangle uh, between Canal and Merrimack, uh, including Causeway Street. I documented uh, for Boston Transportation Department uh, six years ago, the loss of 30 parking spots in just that small area. Uh, there used to be, in fact, nine parking spots on Causeway Street. So uh, there's a lot of people looking for parking because there's been a lot of parking that's been taken away. And when you put those uh, medians across the streets there, people are going to have a lot of trouble uh, getting their cars in and out, and that could affect deliveries and businesses. So I just wonder if you might address why those are there uh, and what the purpose is. I'll refer to the city for that one. Scott, you, you, this is the second minute talk. You and I have talked extensively over the years about this project. You've talked extensively with Peter Gorey about this project. You've raised the curb use issue every time we've addressed it and said that we've done detailed curb analysis. There is, there has been the removal of parking for the DNC along, along Causeway Street. That's not coming back. Um, we have done, we have been installing multi-space meters within the state area, which actually brings more, more, uh, more curb use back to the area and is able to better regulate the curb use to provide the loading for the businesses in the morning and also more use for, um, for uh, metered parking and other hours. Additionally, again, I've explained this to you a number of times, we've had this conversation a number of times, and I think people have made this point. We are not designing just for the madness of 230 dates a year, 300, 303 million people a year. We're designing for the very real AM, PM peak, as well as the heavy pedestrian flows throughout the day. The meeting is designed to channel pedestrians, and, 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 and I say this with all due respect, to encourage good pedestrian behavior and prohibit negative vehicular behavior. So the reason you have the you have the multiple curves when those intersections is cars do some crazy things that we've talked about. The, the, there's a lot of users out here. There's a lot of traffic flow. So the idea is to prevent some illegal U-turns um, and also to recognize that those two intersections, the highest pedestrian volumes in the AM peak are down Canal Street southbound. The highest pedestrian volumes in the DM peak are on Friend Street northbound. We're trying to protect those crossings to the greatest extent possible. We've also just address there's a lot of users out here. So we've had a lot of suggestions. For example, one of the ideas was to drop a lane over near um, uh, Keeney Square. You can't because that backs everything up down Commercial Street all the way down to Atlanta Gallery on the side of Commercial Street. We have looked at this through every lens possible. And at the end of the day, we have tried to do, make this the best design possible for every potential user. It is no design is a perfect design. There is a way to find a flaw in every single aspect of some design because you can't make it perfect. That being said, we have worked very hard with every single butter business. We've had years of meetings years of conversations. We're going to continue to have those years of meetings and years of conversations as we go. That being said, please know that every single concern, every single point that has been made has been addressed. There's not a single organization that's been represented here that has not been met with previously during this project. This conversation includes the West Cycles Union, includes the Little Streets, includes Walk Boston. We will continue to do so. Our design is to create a, a multimodal street, a 21st century street. Crossroads was complete streets before there was complete streets. We're going to continue to do that. That being said, we have to be mindful that both Keeney and Lowell Square have heavy vehicular volumes we have to consider as well. So again, Scott, I hear your point about, about, about curb use, I hear your point about vehicular access. The, the, uh, as Chris Mahar will tell you, the, uh, the Boston Garden Garage, or the North Station Garage, has a capacity of 1,200 or so spaces. Only 300 use those on a daily basis. There's plenty of parking in this area for people who want access to businesses, as well as the venues in this area. Just want to address those different things. But again, looking forward to working with all of you as continue to design. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate what Jonathan has said. We will continue to look at this project uh, under every lens that's being uh, represented this evening to try to accommodate everybody in the best and practicable way possible. You now, I'm starting to hear an echo of the same, the same issues. Does anyone have any other issues that we have not brought uh, forward at this point? Again, we're, we're going to be uh, meeting with people uh, and trying to 
address all these issues. Uh, some of them are very complex. So I want to at least take the time and uh, listen to anyone who has any additional issues. Well, if there's no other questions or comments, I want to remind you that this last sheet of the handout is a mail-in sheet. And I'd like you to take extra copies and give them to any neighbors that may not have been able to attend this evening and encourage them to write in. Um, is the presentation going to be available on, 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 on the uh, internet? Uh, I don't have that ability to do that uh, from the state uh, city bay. The BRA would be happy with this presentation. Oh, no, 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 Thank you. And as well, there's, uh, there's the BRA's planning page has an extensive um, extensive list of these projects. It has versions of design, haven't had have people access it. If somebody wants a, wants a PDF copy, I'm happy to email it to people. So we'll, we'll make this all available online. And I do know it's a very large file, so we'll do our best to make it a management file. Yes, sir. And the, the presentation and the, the video of the meeting will be available at northendwaterfront.com within about 24 hours. Can you repeat that again? The video of the meeting and the uh, presentation and comments will be available on northendwaterfront.com. Northendwaterfront.com. Thank you very much. Thanks. So again, uh, if you have any additional comments, please utilize the uh, mailing brochure on the back. Take photocopies if you need to. I uh, believe the sheet will be tonight. I'll mail it to the department within 10 days. It will become uh, part of the official record. Before I close the hearing, I'd like to say that we'll be here as long as you are interested in looking at the plans or discussing any of these issues with us. So we'll try to respond to those questions that affect you more personally. If there's nothing any further, I want to thank you very much for attending. I want to thank Chris for giving us the facility for this evening. I declare this hearing closed. Yeah. 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 Yeah.